Hello again, everybody. Uh, welcome to another session as we explore the issues of professionalism, why they're important to you as health professionals, and why they provide a, an important interface with you and society. In today's session, we just want to take a brief tour about some of the characteristics of professionalism that are highlighted in many health professions. Before we do this, I just wanted to talk about the rise of moral relativism, shades of grief. Now, there are many philosophies consider concerning ethics and concerning morals. But within the postmodern world, one philosophy that is increasingly being graced is the issue of moral relativism. Now, moral relativism is a view that moral judgments are true or false only relative to some particular standpoint. For example, the morals of one culture may be different from that of another, or the morals in one historical period may be different to that of another period. And ultimately, it suggests that individuals can hold different morals. Collectively, it suggests that no standpoint is uniquely privileged or better than others. Now, this concept of moral relativism means that there are no absolutes. It allows us to then say that we can hear others' opinions and tend to make us more tolerant and more willing to listen to others. Of course, that's of great value. But on the flip side of that, it would suggest that something like slavery, which was relatively accepted during the 16th and 17th century, and even throughout many other periods of history, is not morally wrong, because at the time it was accepted by society. And therefore to say slavery is absolutely wrong, uh, that would not be considered a feature of moral relativism. So I've just given you in a quick, quick two minutes, uh, some of the pros and cons of moral relativism. This is important because even as you are being taught and as, even as you're being exposed to the value system of your profession, what is important is that you think deeply about these values that characterize, characterize professionalism for your profession. And then you have to consider how do they align with your own beliefs? Because if they are simply a list of rules of do's and don'ts, chances are you may not fully embrace them and fulfill the role that your profession or society expects you to. Now, to help us down this journey in this lecture, I'm going to use the document of Physician Charter. Now, this was put out in the context of medicine, and it states that professionalism is the basis of medicine's social contract with society. Even though it was put out for doctors, I believe the values exposed here have relevance for all health professions. And because we can't look at all of them in one lecture, time will not permit. I'm using this document as a template for consideration of all health professions. So the physician charter consists of three fundamental principles. You could think of those as like cardinal reference points that help the physician, help the health profession locate themselves. And then 10 responsibilities. As I go through the three fundamental principles, beyond telling you what they are, I'm going to highlight some of the issues that they raise for you and your future career. So the first principle is the principle of the primacy of patient welfare. The charter states that this principle is based on a dedication to serving the interests of the patient. That's very important because basically what it's saying is within the context of you taking care of your patient, their interest comes ahead of your interest. It goes on to say that altruism contributes to the trust that is central to the physician-patient relationship. And it highlights the fact that market forces societal pressures and administrative issues must not compromise this principle. So it highlights some of the challenges that are putting pressure upon this principle in today's modern world. And let's just look at that a little bit more deeply. 
is an article that I found on CBS News. It references a report a couple of years ago, but it's still very relevant. And it looks at the debate between generic drugs and brand name drugs. Now, you know, brand name drugs cost more and often, and they often contain the same drug as is found in generic drugs. This report from CBS News states that more than 50% of US doctors receive payment from pharmaceutical and medical device industries in 2015, totaling greater than 2 billion US dollars. Now I'm sure that that is not a feature that's unique to the United States. Those payments and gift, gifts encourage doctors to prescribe pricey brand name drugs for particular devices pushed by the sales representatives. And this is supported by research. In other words, when a drug company gives you a gift, the unwritten exchange is that you will now prescribe or support their particular drug, even though that drug may be available in a more cheap generic form. And it was also found that doctors at academic centers were more likely to prescribe generic drugs than expensive drugs after the hospitals restricted rules that ban pharmaceutical sales within that environment. So restrictions of sales visits were, were associated with reduction in prescription for brand name drugs. All of this is a very simple example that just highlights to you how easy and how subtle something can influence your orbit and cause you to no longer put the patient's interest first. You prescribe the drug that is a little bit more expensive. It doesn't necessarily affect you, but it then eventually rebounds the healthcare cost and the, its effect on the patient. So I just want to throw this out because this is something you need to think about. In the modern world, there are also issues of personal versus private. Many, many years ago, that conflict did not seem as uh, acute within the world of the health professions. And within the world of the health professions, uh, doctors were expected to give a lot more of themselves. Now, in many cases, health professionals, dentists, pharmacists, doctors are pushing back and saying, I have a right to a private life. And there's parts of me that I have to take care of first if I'm able to take care of my patients effectively. Like I said, you need to think about what these things mean for you. The second principle is the principle of patient autonomy. And the charter says that physicians must be honest with their patients and empower them to make informed decisions about their treatment. Patients' decisions about their care must be paramount as long as those decisions are in keeping with ethical practice and do not lead to demands for inappropriate care. So this says that patients can't demand any treatment that they want. They can't tell you what to prescribe. But it does say that you are responsible for providing honest and fair information to their patients and then empowering them to make the best decisions that they feel is relevant to their health care. This is often a, cited as a core tenant of ethics and professionalism across the health professions. But let me just highlight what's actually going on here. Patient autonomy is a movement away from something called medical paternalism. Now, paternalism is the interference with the liberty or autonomy of another person. But you're interfering with their liberty, not to harm them, but to do good. So, for example, laws that say you must wear a seat belt or a motorcyclist must wear a helmet. That would be an example of paternalism. Or laws that say you should not use cocaine. That would be an example of paternalism. Because to use cocaine or to not wear a seatbelt or a helmet would put you at risk. And therefore, the government steps in and limits your liberty, but it's for your good. That's called paternalism. Now, Debate can get pushed further, especially when you start to think about the whole issues that surround medicine. And recently in the year 2020, the earth is going through a pandemic 
And there have been great debates about whether masks should be made mandatory or whether they should be not, whether they should not be made mandatory. And what you find is in that societies that accept paternalism more, like Eastern societies, Asian societies, masks are embraced by all and are mandatory. So you find in Korea and Japan, China, that's a standard. But in Western societies that tend to promote individual liberty and individual freedoms and push back against paternalism, mask wearing is only a suggestion. It's often not mandated by governments. And there's been a great pushback from sections of the population about that. So the question is, is autonomy really a central ethical principle? What about something like obesity? Recently, there have been issues about sugar taxes and whether people should put taxes on drinks. Or should people just be allowed to choose what they eat and the effect it has on them is their decision? However, remember, when someone, say, becomes very obese and it leads to cancer, it leads to cardiovascular disease, it leads to strokes, it leads to diabetes, the healthcare cost that is borne by the entire society is tremendous. So in that case, should paternalism step in, not just to affect the individual, but to affect the entire society? Just causing you to think a little bit more deeply about these principles. And finally, I just want to point you to an article. And there are other research like this, where it suggested, again, in certain cultures, paternalism is embraced and actually has benefits. And this particular article highlights that in Latin culture, many patients like paternalism, and it's used well and not abused in many cases. Okay, our third fundamental principle highlighted in the physician charter is the principle of social justice. It says the medical profession must promote justice in the healthcare system, including the fair distribution of healthcare resources. So here we see justice here has nothing to do with laws and the legal system and the criminal court and television program. It has to do with the fair distribution of resources. Physicians, Healthcare professionals should work actively to eliminate discrimination in healthcare based on race, gender, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, religion, or any other social category. So here you see justice talks about two things, the distribution of resources and the issues of discrimination. Here's an interesting case study, just related to justice within the context of medicine. If I were to ask you to describe a typical profile of an individual with heart disease, I suspect you might tell me, middle-aged man, 55 years old, overweight, probably has some other pre-existing conditions like diabetes and hypertension. You would be quite accurate. But do you know in most Western societies, the number of women who die from heart disease is almost equal to the number of men? Often when we think about women dying, we think about issues like breast cancer, which has received much public focus. This is an actual case where a 55-year-old woman complained that her husband was getting better care than she is for her coronary artery disease. They both have angina, chest pain, but her husband received a stress test, cardiac catheterization, and stent replacement within three days of his complaints. It took her over a month and she had to repeatedly complain to get that type of intervention. And this is something that's been seen over and over and over again, that the diagnostic approach to chest pain in women is often less aggressive than those for men for some reason. The reasons are not clear. This would be an example of justice. And so I just want you to, to realize that in some very subtle ways, uh, justice is present, or lack of justice or discrimination is present within our healthcare system. And we need to be aware of these things. And the charter says that as health professionals, we need to uh, work to eradicate these things. I just wanna highlight that last point that this is not something that we are expected to ignore. We're expected to actively work to eradicate these things. Okay, 
Let's finally, well, not really finally, but let's now talk about the 10 professional responsibilities. Now, there's a lot that's going to be uh, spoken of in the next few minutes. And each one of these things, uh, there's so much to delve into. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things and allow you to read the charter on your own and help it to shape you and the direction in which you are going as you begin your career. So the first one is a commitment to professional competence. As a health professional, you must be committed to lifelong learning and you must be responsible for maintaining the medical knowledge, clinical and team skills necessary for the provision of quality care. As a whole, the profession of pharmacists and optometrists must strive to see that all of its members are competent and must ensure that appropriate mechanisms are available to accomplish its goal. This says that the idea of you graduating in the year 2023 and then not touching a textbook for the next 20 years is no longer relevant. In many cases, the bodies that uh, enshroud laws and regulations for your profession no longer allow that, and you have to have regular updates. And even if they no longer allow it, you are supposed to recognize as the pace of information increases, and as knowledge increases, you must stay current in order to take care of your patients and your clients. You must be committed to being competent, and your competence requires lifelong learning as you go forward. Here's another example or another responsibility. You have to be honest with your patients. You have to ensure that your patients have all the information before treatment occurs. Now, this doesn't mean that they have to be involved in every minute decision, but they have to be the ones to decide their course of therapy. An, other, an interesting thing that's highlighted in the charter is physicians should also acknowledge that in healthcare, errors can occur. And it starts to inform how we should treat with errors. And I'm highlighting these things because this is something you have to consider now. You have to think about now. And there are some societies in which this is not discussed. There are some schools in which these are things are not discussed. And so you leave the dental school and you've never been told or discussed what happens if an error occurs and how do you handle it. What about confidentiality? That's listed as an important responsibility for health professionals. And it's stated that earning the trust and confidence of patients requires that appropriate confidentiality safeguards be applied to the disclosure of patient information. And this commitment extends to discussions with the persons acting on a patient's behalf when obtaining the patient's own consent is not feasible. In other words, if a parent tells you something about a child, confidentially applies. Given the widespread use of electronic and technological advances and social media, this is even more important. And patients and doctors and other health professionals must recognize this. Patients and clients must be able to trust that they enter a safe and confidential space when they speak to you. Now, of course, Later on, you will see that there are certain cases where confidentiality can be breached. For example, if a patient or client is going to harm themselves or harm somebody else. But remember, these are the exceptions, not the norm. A commitment to maintaining appropriate relationships with patients. Given the inherent power differential, the inherent vulnerability and dependence of patients and clients upon our health professions, certain relationships between the physician and patients must be avoided. Physicians should never exploit patients for any sexual advantage, personal financial gain, or any other private purpose. Often when you ask people about, uh, is it okay to have a relationship with a past patient? Now that's where things can get a little bit messy. And in a, in a, in a group uh, of, of any group of people uh, looking at this, you often find figures like this where most people will disagree that you shouldn't have relationships with a past person, past patient or past client. But there might be some who think it's acceptable. Remember, this is an area that's great. Issues that you might want to consider are things like, when did you treat the patient? Was it? six months, 
months ago? Was it 10 years ago? How long was that patient under your care? Was it uh, one visit in the emergency room? Or was it a protracted time uh, during which uh, the patient was very vulnerable uh, a year dealing with cancer? What was your role? Uh, was the patient a minor at the time and now they are no longer a minor? Is there some vulnerability there? Or was it a counseling relationship? All of these things are then going to affect whether that could take place. So let me say that once the patient or the client, that relationship is ongoing, then there shouldn't be any of these types of relationships. Once it is past, then you now have to consider what was the nature in the past. The commitment to improving quality of care. This states that you as a doctor, you as a pharmacist, you as a dentist, you as an optometrist, you must be seeking the improvement of the healthcare environment around you. This doesn't just talk about your competence, but it also talks about working with other professionals. And it also talks about de developing better measures of quality care. So I want you to think this just means that you can't just exist in a vacuum, but you must be looking and thinking and considering are the techniques we're using, are the drugs we're using, are the procedures we're using the best, or should we be doing something better to improve things going forward? Commitment to improving access is then linked to that. And this is something I want our healthcare professionals to think about. Often access is difficult for patients. Often waiting times are long. Waiting times to see a dentist waiting times to get a surgery. Should you be concerned about that? The answer is yes. Physicians must individually and collectively strive to reduce the barriers to equitable healthcare. And therefore, we shouldn't set up systems where those who have money can quickly get access, where those who don't have money have to spend four, five, six, seven, eight hours waiting to see a health professional. A commitment to the just distribution of finite resources. And what you're realizing here is that these responsibilities are actually an expansion of many of the fundamental principles. And so this issue of just distribution links to the uh, principle of justice. Now this uh, little cartoon helps to explain justice in a nice way. In the real world, a few people have a lot of resources and the majority of people don't have money. And that would be considered a fair distribution. So often there's a pushback and it says we must have equality. Everybody must have the same thing. But in this context, when everybody has the same thing, we still find a group of societies denied access. And so that led to the issue of not equality, but equity, where everybody doesn't have the same thing, but everybody has equal access. And this is what's promoted in health. This is the basis of things like affirmative action. Now, some of these things can be quite controversial. So this is put forward as theory, but then you have to think about how does it actually work out in practice? So let's think about that, and let's think about our responsibility as healthcare professionals to help ensure there's a just distribution of finance resources. One of the things that these responsibilities are putting out there is that you as health professionals can't just accept the status quo in the system, but you must be proactive in dealing with some of these things where you have the chance to do so. Well, the commitment to scientific knowledge. Physicians have a duty to uphold scientific standards, to promote research, and to create new knowledge and ensure its appropriate use. The issue that's often being put here is that now we must use evidence-based approaches. Not what we did 20 years ago, but what is the current scientific evidence telling us? And we must be committed to supporting these things because these help form the framework or the foundation of our profession. Again, recently, within the pandemic of COVID-19, the different opinions coming forth from medical professionals and health professionals has not helped us as a population and as a society 
manage the pandemic. Inside of this, we see clearly the value of upholding scientific standards and allowing science time to do the research to tell us what's the best way going forward. Couple more. Well, one of the things we have to do as health professionals is maintain trust. And if we have conflicts of interests, we can't do that. Therefore, one of our responsibilities is to both recognize and disclose to our patients and clients where we have a conflict of interest. So for example, if we are being paid by a drug company to do lectures on behalf of them, that is a conflict of interest. And before we prescribe their drugs, we need to disclose that conflict to our patients or our clients. The issue is that, that the issue here is not that there can never be any conflict of interest, because sometimes they do occur. But the important thing is, if they do occur, make sure they don't compromise our professional responsibility and make sure that we let others know about them, especially those who depend upon us. And then a commitment to our professional responsibility. Now that's a bit vague, but basically means we have to be committed to working with other members of the team. In the image there, we see the patient or client is at the center and the team members all are working together to support the patient. And therefore there can't be uh, an unwritten hierarchy within the team where some are considered better and some are considered lesser. All must be treated with respect and all must feel that they are treated with respect. All must recognize the value that they bring to the table. So these are some of the words that you, the students of my current class, came up with when you were considering professionalism. And these are good words. These are good uh, uh, aspects of professionalism that you came up and we put together in this word cloud. And that's why I thought it worth including in this lecture. The most important things that you've answered and highlighted at the beginning of your journey are good communication skills, respect, empathy, and honesty. But there are many other words there like compassionate and humility and competence and integrity, emotional intelligence, trustworthy that you have also highlighted. And I'm sure as you go through your career, some things will get bigger and some things will diminish and there'll be a constant need to balance all of these things to serve the needs of your patients, your clients, and the wider community. So let me end where I began by highlighting that every profession has a list of values which they subscribe to. Given the nature of 21st century life, the law probably suggests and regulates these values into your professions. But beyond the legal regulations, let me suggest that you think deeply about these things and you consider how they impact you and how it's necessary for you to embrace them as you go forward to begin your health professional career.